Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you've been here before or are familiar with the McKaylee Lecture, I mean, McKaylee Center, we used to do these in person for many years, but given the circumstances, we now offer them virtual, which is great because we are, also, we are able to get um, some people who aren't local to the area to join us as well. Um, if you are not new here, thank you for joining us. I mean, if you are new here, thank you for joining us for the first time. Um, just so everybody knows, because I get this question a lot, this is being recorded and it will be up on our YouTube channel um, probably by Tuesday morning. Um, I will send an email out to all the, to everybody who's here with the link. Um, it, your email will also include um, a survey that we'd ask you to fill out, it's like less than five minutes. Mm -hmm. And then if you if you paid for credits, I'll send a separate email with the certificates and those were all, everything that I just mentioned will be out next week. Um, we are going to start with a few words from Dr. Meehan and I'm going to um, mute and hide the other guys and I'm gonna spotlight Dr. Meehan here and um, share a slide for him. Thanks, Stacey. Welcome everybody. I just wanna make a few announcements uh, real fast. So. I think most of you probably know at this point, Kelsey Griffith, who is our mental skills um, expert, and she helps athletes with those sort of mental aspects of sports performance. I wanted to also, though, let you know about Raman Amalon, who is a registered dietitian and a certified strength and conditioning specialist, and she's offering nutrition counseling for athletes both in Waltham and in Norwood. And then starting March 1st, we're making two new additions. Elspeth Hart is a physician assistant who has an expertise in gymnastics-related injuries, and She's starting a return to gymnastics program. Obviously, gymnastics is different than a lot of other sports, and it makes it hard after an injury to know how to properly return someone. And so when they're done with their physical therapy, they're done with whatever treatments they had, um, Elspeth helps them design a program individualized based on them and their injury to get them back to gymnastics. And, um, and then finally, Emily Pluhar is a clinical psychologist who we used to refer man, uh, athletes to for management of anxiety and depression and addiction and other things. Um, she's gonna add more hours and come to work at the McKaylee Center to help treat our athletes for the clinical needs and um, help us with our research. So I just wanna let you all know about that. And then uh, Stacey, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you and enjoy today's lecture. There we go. Thanks, Dr. Meehan. Um, all right, next up we have, as promised, Dr. Michael Beasley. And I am going to unmute you. You're good to share your screen. I am. Cool. Let me just spotlight you there. Awesome. Okay, good to go, Stacey. Yes. All right, guys. So uh, everybody, thanks for joining again. I'm going to be um, uh, your first speaker today. I'm going to be talking mostly about injuries themselves. So we'll go through a, a few things. I do not have any disclosures. I'll try and barrel through a bunch of information, but uh, uh, we'll be around for questions afterwards. And I think at the end, uh, and hopefully there'll be some good overlap between myself and Carl and Miguel uh, on sort of the totality of this information. We're going to talk about throwing injuries. We're going to talk about the pitching process. We'll review shoulder and elbow anatomy so that we can sort of go through some of those injuries and how they affect. And then we'll talk about the arm injuries themselves that are common in throwers, mechanism of injury, how they present, how we diagnose them, and then how we talk about risk, fac risk factors for these or uh, hopefully prevention. So uh, I guess first, how big is this problem? If you look at youth pitchers, 50% of them will report elbow or shoulder pain at least once per season. This goes way higher if we start pitching through fatigue. And you, you guys will hear me say this a lot. It's a really important factor. You cannot pitch through fatigue. So if you're pitching through fatigue, six time uh, the increase, uh, six time increased risk of shoulder pain, four time increased risk of elbow pain. Volume, volume, volume is all we're going to talk about today. Uh, if you pitch more than 75 pitches per game, more than 600 pitches per season, you have a two and a half time risk of shoulder pain, three and three and a half time risk of, shoulder, of elbow pain. Greater than 100, uh, 100 innings per season, three and a half times risk of injury. Uh, and so volume is the issue. We've watched this then transition or translate into surgical risks. So Jimmy Andrews, who's uh, uh, sort of 
probably mostly known for his Tommy John surgeries and elbow surgeries in youth athletes. In between 90, uh, the late 90s and the early 2000s, he had a fourfold increase in college elbow surgeries <clears throat> and a sixfold increase in his high school elbow surgeries. Now, pro probably some of that is referral bias because he became more popular, uh, but clearly there's an issue of increased uh, injury here in, in youth athletes. Again, when you're talking about surgery, not just pain, but surgery, you go more than 80 pitches per game, you're four times more likely for surgery. <clears throat> if you pitch more than eight months per year, you're five times more likely. If you're pitching through fatigue uh, every once in a while, you're four times more likely. If you're regularly pitching through fatigue, you are 36 more times more likely to, to require surgery. Pitch type, this is uh, brought out a lot uh, that breaking balls or when you start them or if you start them too young, that maybe that creates a bigger issue. Kinematic studies say that that's not the case. We don't see increased stressors across the shoulder of the elbow versus a fastball. We don't see any clear injury increase with first or consistent use, so when you start, but we do see positive trends in that direction. So it is something to keep in mind, but we don't have great data to say that the, you know, the curveball or the breaking ball is evil uh, when it comes to pitching, it's, it's more volume. There is some increase of pain risk. And again, we just talked about how pain can translate into injury uh, or, or, or worse, uh, but it's a bit mixed. So the slider uh, has some uh, increased chance of elbow pain uh, quite a bit, 86%, but actually has maybe some potential to be protective at the shoulder. The curveball uh, increases shoulder pain by 52%, but maybe has some evidence of being protective at the elbow. So it's where we put our stressors. Change up though has uh, almost no issues. Decrease elbow pain, decrease shoulder pain. So I think especially for youth pitchers, if we can get them to maximize their use of a change up, uh, which can be such an effective pitch, you can sort of maybe have less of those issues. Technique we talk about a lot and uh, uh, Miguel and I run a pitcher's clinic where we look at technique, uh, but the truth is the data doesn't really show it very well. It's hard for us to demonstrate that in a quote unquote improper pitching mechanic leads to shell, uh, elbow and shoulder pain. Uh, it's That's difficult to sort of define, it's difficult to demonstrate. What we can see though, is that if you take successful pitchers and low injury pitchers, they seem to have similar positions and similar movements uh, across any age or uh, skill level. And so we believe that we can alter mechanics. Miguel and I, when we go through pitching mechanics, I am not a, a pitching coach. I'm not looking for performance. We're looking at how they use their body. We're trying to look at injury prevention and how we increase stressors through the arm. So I still think that that is a uh, great potential to be helpful. When you look at a pitch, um, uh, I don't think it's too hard to understand why we might have uh, difficulty with this, why we might have injury with this. The mechanism itself is, is brutal. It's, it's not a normal motion for the arm. Um, but we want to sort of break that down. When is it that we struggle with these issues and when is it uh, can it create injury? So the, the windup itself, that first, uh, uh, that first motion up until you bring your hands apart with that, le that lead leg up, uh, very little risk. There's, there's little that can happen there. The stride can create some issues, whether it's too long or too short. Uh, in either case, you have to overcompensate for that momentum loss, especially if it's too short. And then if you don't land in a straight position, if you're leaning towards first base or third base, depending on your, your handedness, uh, you can stress your anterior capsule because you're kind of shearing across the body. And we see that quite a bit when Miguel and I do these evaluations. Uh, the cocking phase is, is one of our highest risk phase. So that's that early portion of bringing the hand back. That's when you're at your max abduction and external rotation. Huge risk for internal uh, impingement, which can lead to labrum tearing, stretch out that anterior capsule, which we'll talk about. Um, and then you go into the acceleration phase. There's a huge change in direction there. You're um, sort of stressing every stabilizer that you have, rotator cuff, ulnar collateral ligament. This is where little league elbow tends to happen is through this acceleration, uh, through the caulking and through the acceleration phase. And then deceleration and follow through, even that has to be a bit controlled. You can have a risk of injury there. Uh, slap tears, um, a, a proper follow through should really decrease your injury risk. So I think it, of all the things that we look at with uh, technique, this is one of the things that we try to focus on as well. So let's go into anatomy and then injury. So the shoulder anatomy, uh, we talk about sort of the, really only three bones, the collarbone or the clavicle, the scapula, but you see uh, that that uh, also contains the acromion, the coracoid, and the glenoid itself, the socket. Uh, and so that's sort of the mainstay. And then the humerus, 
which then creates three different joints, your sternoclavicular, where the clavicle meets the sternum, your acromioclavicular or your AC joint. And again, that's a, that's a triangle of ligaments between the acromion, the clavicle and the coracoid. Uh, and then the main joint, the ball and socket joint, the glenohumeral joint. Um, uh, this is sort of looking directly into it. You see this sort of pocket uh, and the surrounding um, uh, rotator cuff, three of them behind, well, one above and two behind, and then the subscapularis in front. And this is, this is sort of a naturally unstable joint. We, we talk about it being a, a, a golf ball sitting on a tee. This is a tiny socket and a big ball. Uh, and we, we get uh, great motion from that. We have more range of motion in the shoulder than any joint in the body, but we pay for it with stability. And so that beca becomes part of our issue. Um, you see just this amount of movement that we can get uh, with this ball and socket joint that can create some issue, especially in a high dynamic move like a pitch. Soft tissues that we have to think about, the biceps tendon, you see that biceps tendon running up through here, up through the bicipital groove and then attaching um, uh, uh, along the glenoid labrum. Um, subacromial bursa, uh, you see this sitting here. So again, supraspinatus comes, then bursa, then the, chromian, uh, the acromion and the clavicle. So this is where we get and get some in impingement that can get trapped and then have some injury to the uh, supraspinatus as well. The labrum, uh, uh, this sort of bumper, I always uh, talk to patients about it being a suction cup because uh, it really helps with stability of the glenohumeral joint. Uh, and also uh, like any suction cup, if you tear it, it becomes less able to do its job. And then the rotator cuff, again, muscles surrounding it, supposed to act like pulleys, not necessarily giant stabilizers, but unfortunately we rely upon them to do that sometimes. So the injuries we're gonna to cover today, we're gonna to talk about the spectrum of little league shoulder. We'll talk about GERD or glenohumeral internal rotation deficit and what that can include. Um, when we lose control of the scapula, that's a main aspect of what our stability is. And then we'll talk about true shoulder instability and, and labor impairs that are associated with it. So little league shoulder, um, probably one of the most common things that we're looking for. This is a stress fracture. This is a stress injury from traction of the growth plate that's at the top of the, of the humerus. Um, and so this is, again, both from rotation just gradually progressive shoulder pain. This is not an acute onset all of a sudden it happened. This is over days or weeks or sometimes even months, you have this progressive sense of pain into the lateral shoulder. Usually if the x-rays are able to show us this, uh, uh, especially if we look at comparison views of the uh, non-throwing shoulder, sometimes it's hard to know when a growth plate is a little bit wide or is it normal. Uh, and so if we look at the non-throwing shoulder, we should have a great comparison of where that person is in development. And so um, this is a, a, an example of a patient that I saw this is a left-handed thrower. So here's their right hand, here's their left hand, their dominant hand. And you see this uh, growth plate along the edge here, um, uh, which is a normal appearance. And then here you see how wide this is. So this is sort of a classic appearance of a widened um, uh, growth plate on the left side there, on the right side of your screen. Um, Stacy, can you tell me, are, is everybody able to see my arrow, my cursor? Um, yes, I can see it. Okay, it's perfect. Very small. Okay. And so here's a, a, a similar view of the same problem, um, uh, but you see, especially on this outside aspects, uh, that you see this widened growth plate. So this is a typical appearance of little league shoulder where you widen that growth plate from stress. Uh, here's that same patient three months later. So here's their big, wide um, uh, a growth plate at the top of that arm bone, and here it's normalized after just rest. So three months, 12 weeks of rest, uh, and that has totally normalized. Same, same uh, thing again, this huge wide uh, growth plate, and then three months later after rest, looking great. And so that's all we do. The true treatment for any, like any stress injury is just rest, you, but you really can't throw. And we often talk about 10 to 12 weeks being three months uh, out of throwing. And this is really no throwing. It's, it's only really the baseball mechanism that creates this problem. There are very few other versions of throwers or over in athletes that get this. We can see it in other racket athletes and things like that, but it's predominantly, it's called little league shoulder for a reason. It's predominantly baseball throwers. But once it's irritated, we try and minimize any risk of that. So no throwing at all. Uh, Physical therapy is a mainstay here. You have to maintain and improve your range of motion, uh, get better periscapular and postural control. And hopefully, uh, uh, I know Carl's gonna talk about this. 
Um, and then a progressive return to throwing program. Again, like any stress injury, the worry is that if you take somebody out of something for a long time and then ramp them back up quick, uh, you have potential to struggle. So we want to be cautious about how we ramp them, ramp them back into throwing. Then moving on to glenohumeral internal rotation deficit um, uh, uh, and what that can cause. So as we pitch, as we bring that arm back into that cocking phase, that acceleration way externally rotated, um, we can gain external rotation by stretching out that anterior capsule, maybe even some bony ab uh, adaptations. We can uh, stretch out our ability to go backwards. But then we lose our ability to go forward or we have potential for that. And often we lose that internal rotation way more than we gain the external rotation. And so we talk about a total arc of motion. And that being that if you shift your arc of motion from your throwing arm to your left arm, so let's say you gain 10 degrees or 15 degrees going back into external rotation, but you also only lose 10 or 15 degrees the other way. If you can maintain that same total arc of motion, usually around 180 degrees, then that's okay. Where we struggle is when we have somebody who's like this, and this isn't a, a, a great view because we, usually you have to have scapular control, but you can see that this person has all this movement on their left arm and really uh, hampered by their movement on their right arm. And that's what we see. So I, this is something I check uh, not for shoulders uh, only, but for elbows as well. If, if you can't move it with a shoulder, you're going to have to pay for it somewhere. Uh, and oftentimes this can create some elbow issues. Typically, we just have to go through stretches. So we have to go through posterior capsular stretches. Way too often, we have throwers that get stretching in a doorway and they, they're, they're doing anterior capsular stretches when, that, when that's, they already have that motion, we need to work on posterior cancer. So sleeper stretches, different versions, rollover sleeper. Um, uh, here's a rollover sleeper, this cross arm and then doorway. But again, it's, it's doorway stretches there for the posterior capsule, uh, not for the uh, anterior capsule. Prognosis is great. 90 plus percent of these, uh, I would say closer to 100, respond to a totally non-surgical plan. This is, this, is not, this is rarely something that you would consider uh, a, a surgical problem. It becomes a surgical problem only if you have secondary injuries. And so if we have slap tears or rotator cuff tears associated with the stressors that we get from this, uh, it can become a bigger issue. Then moving on to scapular control. Uh, uh, the scapula is the main anchor for our throwing motion for really any motion of the shoulder. And so uh, uh, I always think about, here is what it looks like to come from an unstable base. Here's this cat trying to make this jump, he's on ice. So he has no stable base. So it, it's like standing on a surfboard. It, it doesn't matter how hard you jump. If you don't have a stable base, the harder you jump, the more your legs are gonna go out from underneath you. Versus a stable base. If you have a stable base, then you can, the harder you jump, the further you go. This is what it means to have scapular control. If you don't have a stable base with your, with your scapula tacked against your rib cage, then you're going to have an increased risk that you're going to have instability through the whole motion. And so with scapular dyskinesia, uh, we talk about abnormal motion or poor control of the shoulder blade through its motion. And so then that can lead to really abnormal kinematics of the shoulder joint, of that glenohumeral joint. Postural changes are increasing this. We live progressively seated lives. Uh, we spend most of our time over a phone uh, uh, or a laptop or a computer. And so we're really sort of losing uh, even further than we were this postural control, which is a major problem. We, we treat it with rehab. You treat it, get into a periscapular postural program, better core control, uh, and usually we can get great results from that. And then lastly, for the shoulder, we talk about instability, true instability of the shoulder joint. Uh, one of the things we see is <clears throat> multi-directional instability. When we talk about anterior, like a, a, a acute traumatic shoulder dislocation, those are usually anterior. They're usually going forward. Um, chronically, though, you can have some instability that occurs, and that can be in all directions, usually anterior and inferior, frontward and down. You can get posterior instability, but it's a, it's a much less common issue. If it's chronic, this is often atraumatic or related to some prior injury. Uh, certainly people who have ligamentous laxity or loose joints have potential for this. And then if you do repetitive micro trauma, especially with GERD or other capsular restrictions uh, and overuse, then you can combine this into some instability issues. The presentation will feel like it's loose. Uh, they'll have pain, they'll have a sense of instability, they'll have apprehension to range of motion from the shoulder, they'll have popping sensation. One of the things we have to try and differentiate, and sometimes it's hard, is, is your shoulder popping because it's moving around the joint, or is your shoulder catching or locking because there's a labrum tear and something's in the way? 
we talk about this spectrum of subluxation to dislocation, subluxation, this idea that sort of that ball's getting to the end, edge of the socket but never truly leaves uh, versus the dislocation where there, there are distinct dislocation and relocation or reduction moments. Uh, and so uh, making that difference, making that sense of where you stand with that patient, I think is important because um, uh, dislocations, once they happen, especially traumatically in youth athletes, there's a super high risk that it happens again uh, versus subluxation, which maybe you're able to get uh, much better control of. Diagnosis for shoulder instability, we get them into that high risk anterior dislocation position, which is this abduction and external rotation, which we, what we call apprehension testing. Basically, we get them into this position, we see how far they let us go, and doesn't make them apprehensive. Um, for inferior instability, we talk about the sulcus sign. So if you just pull a sort of direct traction on the arm, do you see this sort of sulcus underneath the clavicle and the acromion there? Treatment, uh, multidirectional uh, uh, usually responds to PT instability. Uh, we have to associate, especially with big dislocations, we have to associate for other injuries, so labral tears, rotator cuff injury, which is not very common in youth athletes, but uh, in adult athletes, something we have to think about from trauma. Rotator cuff syndrome uh, uh, is just this idea that we lose control. So again, our anatomy uh, on the left side of your screen, we have the back view. So we sort of see the three main uh, rotator cuff muscles that we see coming from the back. So the supraspinatus, which really comes along the top, uh, and then the infraspinatus and the teres minor, all of these sort of attach at the outside aspects of the shoulder. So usually this relates to some lateral shoulder pain, outside shoulder pain. This front view, you see it, as well as the subscapularis, which comes from the inside of the, of the scapula. And this is a spectrum. Uh, you can have spectrum of rotator cuff syndrome, which a lot of times is sort of rotator cuff fatigue. Again, they're designed to be pulleys, not necessarily major static stabilizers, but we often require them to be. And so they can sort of lose their ability. We just sort of lose, they lose strength uh, from overcompensating like anything else does. You can also have partial injuries or even full tears. Again, a full tear of a rotator cuff muscle in a youth athlete is very uncommon, certainly not from just repetitive throwing. That would be very bizarre. We, we see it from trauma. We see it from uh, acute injuries from fall. Again, chronic overuse or fatigue, we can get some tendinopathy or tendinitis, uh, same with impingement, but unlikely to have um, uh, full tears from that. For treatment for this, uh, unless you're having frank weakness or an uh, acute large tear that you're aware of, this is, again, this is a conservative care, it's predominantly PT. So you guys are uh, uh, sort of uh, getting a, a repeat performance here. PT is the issue. That's why Carl's uh, uh, going to be such an important. Carl and Miguel are going to be such important points here. We start with stability. So again, if the if the stable base is that scapula, I always talk about. It doesn't matter how strong or or how healed you can get your rotator cuff if you don't have a stable base you're going to do it again and so it's not just working on rotator cuff band exercises it's about core stability and shoulder stability getting that shoulder blade tacked back down subacromial impingement uh, again is this idea of here you have this bursa that's stuck in between the supraspinatus and the acromion and we bring that up we bring by the nature of our uh, rotation uh, especially this internal rotation aspect of the arm we bring that bone up against the bursa, up against uh, trapping between the bone and the supraspinatus. And so we can get rotator cuff fatigue or breakdown from that. Um, sometimes athletes, especially with previous injury who have had prior AC separations uh, or repetitive injuries, you can have things that uh, promote this. So you can have um, a joint hypertrophy where that joint grows and creates some problems. Um, or you can have an, uh, an accessory acromion or an osochromiali, this extra bone there. So uh, it's just something that uh, sometimes we get this dynamically because we just create that space. Sometimes we get it because we have anatomic problems that create that as more of an issue. Typically, this responds well to anti-inflammatories. Again, we get into a good PT program to try and stabilize that shoulder. Occasionally, if it seems like we're unable to break that cycle, there are some people who might benefit from an injection here, a corticosteroid or a cortisone injection. Um, we, we, we don't use that as a cure. It doesn't cure anything. I always tell patients in the history of time, nobody's ever needed a subacromial injection, but sometimes people want them if we're struggling, if we're failing to do PT because our pain is too much, then sometimes we need something to help break that cycle. All right, so that was a lot. We're gonna switch over to the elbow now, uh, initially with anatomy and then injuries, uh, and then I'll finish up. So uh, for the elbow, again, similar to the shoulder, we're talking about three bones, the humerus and the radius, uh, or the humerus uh, coming down into the radius and the ulna. Um, 
a, a pretty complex joint. We talk about the major range of motion we think of about is this, this flexion and extension. But we talk about pronation and supination. We think of this often as a wrist motion. This actually comes from the elbow. So something we have to consider as well. And then in youth athletes, we have to think about growth plates. There are six different growth centers, six different growth plates in the elbow. And so sometimes our imaging becomes difficult. So we use comparison images uh, of the non-dominant uh, elbow all the time to sort of know where we stand. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of difficult to know, is this an abnormal appearing growth plate or a normal growth plate that is in the midst of what we call ossification or sort of uh, transitioning from cartilage to bone. Soft tissue, obviously, uh, we think about all the time, particularly the ulnar collateral ligament or the Tommy John ligament. We'll talk about those injuries, uh, which again is, is less a single ligament and more a complex of ligament. Um, the biceps tendon uh, we talked about in the shoulder, again, that comes down and attaches uh, and runs through the elbow. So something we think about. And then the triceps tendon, which can create some injuries to the back of the elbow as well. So elbow injuries, um, we'll talk about little league elbow and sort of the spectrum of what that means. Uh, UCL tears or Tommy John uh, uh, ligament tears, lateral pain. So again, we the, the lion's share of the focus certainly goes to the inside or medial aspect of the elbow. That's where most of our injuries are. But again, if you're gonna open up uh, or stress one side of the joint, it's gotta close down on the other sides of the joint. So we'll talk about things that can cause some pain on the outside and the back of the elbow as well. Little league elbow, we, again, we, we classically describe this as medial elbow pain, uh, pain that's on the inside aspect of the elbow. Uh, and this is really about who the weakest link in the chain is. So as we grow that medial epicondyle, that bony portion on the inside of the elbow, uh, that, is the, that is the growth center that we're often talking about, the growth play that we're talking about. And so where you are in your growth can then affect who the link, weakest link is. We have the ulnar collateral ligament that attaches there. We have common flexor tendon, strong flexor muscles that attach attached there. And so if you're image, if you're skeletally immature, if you're young, um, then irritation of the growth plate, uh, where you sort of pull and stress that growth plate, that's the, the growth plate's the weakest link. As you start to close that growth plate, then there's this real battle of who the uh, stronger uh, link is, whether it's the soft tissues or the bone, and you can get an acute, what we call an avulsion fracture. You pull a piece of that growth plate away. And then once you're skeletally mature, the weakest link becomes the soft tissues, the common flexor tendon and the, <clears throat> and the ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, again, common flexor tendon, the uh, flexor tendons of the hand and the wrist come up and attach in one long, uh, one big common flexor tendon at that medial epicondyle. Uh, and so we have to think about that as uh, being a proponent of this as well. And again, if you're going to open, if you're going to stress open the medial or inside aspect of the elbow, then it, something has to change, right? So you close down on that uh, lateral, that outside portion in the back, so you can get these compressive forces to either of those. So <clears throat> little league elbow typically presents uh, uh, with pain at the elbow, um, uh, and they might have a real spectrum of it bothers me a little bit, but not really when you press, to super tender, won't move it, um, this, and, and it depends on which their injury is. So this valgus or stress, uh, valgus stress or milk maneuver <clears throat> is, uh, uh, we try to create this stress of the UCL, try to open it similarly to how it would during a throwing motion. If you have a UCL tear, uh, you might feel that laxity, but oftentimes they're pretty guarded uh, if you're gonna have a UCL tear or if you're having irritation of the growth plate, because it's just painful when you do this. But this, is, this should be something that you uh, uh, do with, or that we are gonna do with every single, um, one of these patients, because if I can create that stress and have a sense of great stability and not a lot of pain, it automatically makes me feel a lot more confident about where that elbow stands. And then you just have to know about the history. They'll, they'll sort of tell you the story. <clears throat> if you have this progressive worsening pain, but not a moment, then that's usually just the irritation of the growth plate, especially again, if they're young and immature, you see this widening of the growth plate on the x-ray here. If all of a sudden you have a pop, if it was maybe painful or not painful, and then you throw a pitch and there's a pop sensation and they're still developing, then we worry about this avulsion fracture. So you see this piece of the medial epicondyle that has been pulled away from its, uh, from its home here. And so that's an avulsion fracture. And then you can get a sudden pop and that loss of velocity in a closed growth plate in somebody who's older, and then you worry about the ulnar collateral ligament. X-ray we usually use to evaluate uh, the medial epicondyle either. Does it look like it's being stressed? Does it look like it's pulled away? Or has it closed? And so then we have to think about uh, soft tissues. <clears throat> 
MRI is what we use to uh, look for soft tissues. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the apophysitis, <coughs> uh, again, that irritation, that growth plate, uh, we often treat with like six to 12 weeks of no pitching or throwing. We use anti-inflammatories, ice and physical therapy, and then a gradual return to throwing program. <coughs> Medial epicondyle avulsion fractures, if we really pull away, um, sometimes those require to uh, have surgery. Uh, that's <clears throat> a little bit controversial. We're finding more and more people tend to do well with these as long as there's not a nerve entrapped or it's not significantly displaced. But uh, uh, I guess just recognize that some of these uh, avulsion fractures are significant enough that they require to be replaced. And we talk about Tommy John ligament. I think that's the, what always gets most of the focus. Uh, again, <clears throat> the Tommy John ligament or the UCL, this is a micro trauma problem. It's rare that a single traumatic event can do it, but it can happen if somebody falls and stresses that. Um, most of the time, <clears throat> a strain or a partial tear presents as this progressive pain. A full rupture is this sudden, I lost it, sudden pain and pop and loss of power. Um, uh, when we hear this story, you, you initially get x-ray again, you're looking for loose bodies or bony avulsions or something else. Uh, and then the MRI uh, and sometimes ultrasound can really help us uh, define the severity of the injury or the tear. So you look at the history of this, uh, uh, the first Tommy John surgery was done on Tommy John. Uh, that's why it's uh, called that. This was a reconstruction in 1974. He came back to the major leagues after that and won an additional 164 games and retired at 46 years old. This was either wonderful or terrible because the, this is unquestionably the most successful Tommy John surgery in the history of time. You wonder if this had not gone so well, would we still be doing the same surgery? Would he, we have adapted it? We've adapted it some, but uh, uh, I think this really drove this market of this repair as, a, as an idea. I think it's really stressed that, <clears throat> really important to stress that this is, this is not a fix. This is not an ideal fix, at least. Uh, when you look at college or professional, you're talking maybe 80 plus percent. That means 20 percent of people do not get back. And when you talk about success, I want to be clear here. The success when they talk about that is I have returned to at least a single game at my level of play. Doesn't mean a career, a long career like Tommy John. It gets worse as you get younger. <clears throat> so in high school pitchers, maybe uh, 75 percent or less. And it's a long rehab. You have this surgery, you're talking 12 to 18 months before you can get back to throwing. Uh, and there's a sort of lasting rumor that's always around that uh, we can build it back stronger. And so some people almost think like, boy, it, and maybe it's nice just to get it over with um, uh, and, and then I'll be better. That's, that's not really the case. You're not stronger post-op. You're not going to have a better scenario post-op. You're going to have altered mechanics. Um, and so it's a, it's, it is a non-ideal scenario to, to get to this point. Um, uh, a couple of things that can cause pain uh, more towards the outside. <clears throat> we talk about osteochondritis dissecans and something called Panner's disease. Both of these uh, affect the same area and both of them are a decreased blood supply problem. It's a matter of how they present. Um, so uh, you lose blood supply uh, and then you uh, start to have degradation of this bone and cartilage in the capitellum, which is this area sitting here above the head of the radius. Um, you'll get pain on the outside of the elbow. You can get mechanical loose bodies, so people feel catching or locking in this elbow. Um, and so here's a, an x-ray um, with this degradation of bone sitting into the capitellum right above the radial head. Uh, this is an age difference. Uh, Panner's disease, um, uh, we usually don't have a clear reason for. Uh, this is a self-limited problem uh, in younger ages, maybe five to maxing out at around 12. Uh, osteochondritis desiccans or this OCD lesion, we typically see, uh, we see it most common in, gy in gymnasts because they're weight bearing into the arm. We can see it in throwing athletes, but it's less common, but this is often older, 12 to 16 years old. And then uh, going to the back of the elbow, you can get posterior impingement. So you see on this x-ray, this little bony spur. <clears throat> if we repetitively lock our elbow as a throwing motion, if we overlock, you can just start to callus the bone or irritate the bone as this olecranon, this little hook of the olecranon fits into its process there. And so you can create chip fractures or bony spurs or cartilage injuries. Uh, these athletes will, will not want to fully extend. And so sometimes we, they present with other issues because they're trying to throw without fully extending, which can create some other stressors for the elbow or shoulder. 
you can have, uh, this is obviously a very dramatic version of this, but the, there's a bursa, a fluid sac at the base of the elbow um, that can uh, become either infected or traumatically if you land on it, if it can become swollen. And so if you see this sort of, uh, it's often not this large, but if you see this um, sort of pink or warm or red, um, slightly swollen elbow, especially in the back, this can be olecranon bursitis. We worry about this being infectious. It's one of the two bursa uh, that can become infectious uh, at a fairly high risk, and that needs to be treated fairly quickly. So uh, this would require some uh, uh, a quick evaluation. So I'll finish up. Um, uh, how do we decrease risk? How do we decrease all these injuries? Uh, again, pain is no gain. This is a scenario where you do not want to try and force yourself through pain. Um, volume is, is the problem here more than anything else. Yes, we looked at mechanics. Yes, we looked at curveballs and breaking balls. Yes, we looked at all these things. But volume is the issue. Uh, you have to follow pitch in any counts. <clears throat> I think that the worst possible combo is pitcher-catcher. Uh, uh, for every pitch, the catcher's got to throw it back. Uh, and so if you're doing that combined, you're not really counting pitch counts. Third base, uh, again, especially in the youth leagues, if you throw hard, you, that's where you go. You're a pitcher uh, or you're third base. And so that combination is not ideal. If you can be pitcher in first base or per, pitcher in outfield, pitcher in uh, middle infield, I think that's more ideal. And then they should have real time off, three to four months uh, off per year. Um, there is a clear... Um, uh, disadvantage or a higher risk of injury if you live in the lower half of the United States. And that's just because of how often you're able to play. And now with indoor leagues and skills and everything has taken over, uh, uh, we really, uh, every pitcher especially, should spend three to four months off, off, off throwing per year. Um, and then again, uh, in terms of breaking, consider changeup. Again, we don't have great evidence, but I think that uh, the changeup can be such an effective tool and, and, and decrease stressors that may decrease in, uh, injury. And then we talk about strengthening, and that's where uh, Miguel and uh, Carl are going to take over talking about how do we, we rehab, how do we uh, evaluate these aspects, and then how do we treat. I'll have references that you guys will have available for me. Uh, and so I'm happy to take questions. Say that. I don't know if we're going to do questions now or questions uh, after, but I'm happy to take in either case. Yeah, we can do a few questions um, right now that are just for Dr. Beasley. So if you go to the bottom, you can submit your question through the Q&A down here. Give it a minute. <clears throat> I think someone raised their hand, but I can't do anything with that. <laughs> if you raise your hand and you have a question, you can submit it through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Oh, here we go. Okay, you so... You want to click on that yourself? Okay. Yeah, cool. I, yeah, I can see it. So does the size of, the size of the joint play a role in injury risk? Um, so <clears throat> uh, I, I don't know uh, if that means... Oh, I'm, I'm already losing them. Oh, sorry. Go to the answer side. Oh, yeah. Uh, does the side of the joint play a role in injury risk? Um, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, uh, what you mean by that, whether it's a size, of, a size of the person or or size of the uh, joint itself, like if somebody has a naturally larger joint. Um, most of the injuries that we're talking about are biomechanical ones. And so I think... Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, you you see uh, a pitcher like Chris Sale, right, who is just this tiny guy uh, and can create all these forces, and his mechanics sort of made you think that uh, uh, this can't last forever. But we see that all the time. If you look at pitchers across high levels, college, high school, anything, uh, we see all different versions of pitchers, whether they're uh, very muscular or very thin. Um, uh, and so I think from a, from a size standpoint, I don't think muscular strength is a big protector or um, demonizer of sport uh, or of injury. I think overall size of joint, um, it's not even the size, it's about how protected it is. And again, especially <clears throat> the elbow has very uh, sort of uh, uh, interesting mechanics. The shoulder is a naturally unstable joint, no matter how, uh, no matter how it stands. So I think that can, that can play a major role. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. If it didn't, if, uh, if that wasn't clear, uh, uh, throw another question in there. Um, uh, next question I see is other than post 
uh, career length, what made the first Tommy John so successful? Nobody knows. That's a great question. So I think Job did the surgery. Um, uh, I think even even the surgeon has looked back and said, I don't <laughs> I, I don't know if it was good that this was so successful. Um, you look at uh, Nolan Ryan uh, had a long career as well, and he snapped his UCL on his second to last pitch. And then his last pitch was like a 94 mile an hour fastball. Uh, and then he walked off the mound. So I think that some people are able to compensate in a way that is just incredible. We see that across all sports, but I don't think there's a great reason that we um, uh, uh, have some people who are so successful with it and other people that are just, uh, it's just not a great, it's not a great solution. It, it does some, but I think most often you think people coming back from UCL, uh, the, they, they have a, uh, they have a majority uh, chance that they'll they'll do well and be able to return, but not necessarily a great one. Uh, how often do you perform a lower extremity examination for shoulder and elbow pain? <clears throat> so, um, I would say definitely, uh, I definitely perform a shoulder exam for every elbow pain and an elbow exam for every shoulder pain. So those two come together, I always look at. And then lower body, anytime we're looking at pitching mechanics or throwing mechanics, I definitely do that. This is what Miguel and I do every time. Uh, and so often what we see is a total lack of control through the core, poor hip mobility, overextension of the spine, all these compensatory movements, because uh, uh, the, sort of the, the path of least resistance for a, a kid who can throw hard is just to throw hard and not necessarily use their body. So uh, I think <clears throat> if you're really looking at mechanics and there's not a clear right clear reason why somebody is getting injured, and I think that's how we use our pitching mechanics, our, our pitcher's analysis the most, uh, is uh, somebody who's having repetitive pain or injury and it's not clear why, then we, then we sort of go after it. And then I would say that the back answer to that is every time I see somebody with shoulder uh, or elbow pain, Whatever PT program, I do a little bit guided to what their problem is and a whole lot guided elsewhere. So everybody gets periscapular and postural. Everybody gets low back, low core, peripelvic, sort of hip flexor. I sort of aim at everything because I know that everybody needs it. Um, are there any studies out there examining joint stresses on the elbow comparing different pitches? Yeah, so those are those kinematic studies. Um, uh, those are out there. And again, that's what's sort of tricky is that we think of breaking balls, uh, uh, curves, pitchers, sliders, um, uh, being a more dangerous pitch, especially if we start at the youth age, the data is not great. Uh, the data shows that there's not huge changes from a fastball um, to a breaking ball, either a curve or a slider or a slurve. Um, uh, uh, there's not there's not great kinematic studies that show that there are big increased stressors, increased risk of pain. Yes, increasing risk of injury, maybe, but not necessarily big changes on stressors, which makes it interesting. So again, I think uh, uh, I would say. You know, maybe, maybe uh, again, I would I would love people to focus on the uh, the changeup more than breakers when they're young before they're skeletally mature. But I think if I had a choice, I would say low volume and throw your breakers rather than uh, no breakers and a ton of volume. Volume volume is the problem. Uh, with GERD, are we looking at loss of internal rotation or trying to maintain total motion compared to the other side? Great question. So, um, uh, yeah, you want total arc of motion. That that's the key is that you should have a symmetric sense of total arc of motion. And that there should be some, <clears throat> because of that, the, the, the key is symmetry. If you, if you're, um, you, you know, if you're able to extend 15 degrees, uh, and this is what I see all the time, maybe you get five or 10 degrees more external rotation when compared to your non-dominant side, but then you lose 30 from the internal rotation and then that's your problem. And so um, there's, there's some mild uh, uh, controversy about how much internal rotation deficit is, is the problem. I think it's definitely a problem, but I think what you're looking for is not whether you've shifted the dial. If you've moved the dial so that you're negative 10 and positive 10, I'm okay with that. Uh, but if you, if you have 180 degrees on your non-dominant side and 155 degrees of total arc of motion on your throwing side, you're, you're going to have trouble. And, I, and again, I address that for, for any elbow that comes in. One of the first things I look at is what is their internal rotation. And almost always you find that it's a problem. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we'll move on to Carl, but if anybody has remaining questions for Dr. Beasley, we can continue questions as we go on. And um, at the end, all three of them will pop back on and some questions might be appropriate for two or three of them to answer too. So that would be great. Thanks, Dr. Beasley. Yeah. Carl, are you ready?
also. Um, yeah, I just think you have to help show your video. I don't see where it says on my screen that I would share screen. Um, hold on one second. It doesn't say share screen at the bottom? No. Can you help share your video? Um, it is, all I have is a, right now, let me pull up here. Okay, now we go, here we go. All right, so start video and then share screen. Okay. Perfect. Can you see that now? Yes. <clears throat> all right, so I'll blow that up and let me just go back up okay. to the beginning. All righty. All right, thank you, um, Stacy And Mike, that was great. That was uh, great information. I love when the, the physician goes first because they can take that anatomy to the next level and the diagnosis. Um, so I'm Carl Gustafson. I'm a PT, athletic trainer, and strength uh, conditioning specialist here at the Division of Sports Medicine over at the McKaylee Center. And I work closely with uh, Dr. Beasley and Miguel, which is great. I mean, literally, we are in the same office um, at least two days a week. So that allows us to, um, you know, talk about patients, confer about things, and also just um, to see each other's uh, technique as to how we're going through our program. So what I wanted to do today is um, some of the slides that I'm talking about, um, some of it Mike, Dr. Beasley already covered. Um, so I'm gonna kind of blow through the uh, anatomy side of it because um, we just got such a great, description from Dr. Beasley, and then I'll get more into the rehab side. So um, we, you know, we're gonna talk about the act of throwing to talk about the, typically what I will see is more youth adolescent. Um, Miguel I know has a great expertise with playing semi-pro baseball and working with college um, and higher up athletes. So I think he's gonna take over for there. And then what I wanna do is really, I'm gonna pick on everybody. Hopefully there's a lot of PTs and ATs in the crowd uh, because I've had the, um, positive and negative effect of working with sports medicine really closely over the last uh, 25, 30 years. Um, but at the same time, I also worked in private practice. So I can see when someone isn't progressing, I can see that sometimes I have to blame the rehab program just didn't go far enough to let the athlete return. So hopefully three good things will happen. You'll say, I knew that, that's great when you have a talk. Um, you'll say, maybe I didn't know that, that's really good, you learned something. And maybe you'll even say to me today, I don't even believe that, I'm gonna look it up and that's also good. So throwing, this is literally the line that I use when someone comes in, I say, let's start the conversation off by saying it's not good for you. Um, it's extreme ranges. Now I'm not just picking on pitchers here or throwers because I like to even say that with gymnasts, I like to say that with swimmers with their shoulders. Um, and so what I want you to think of, if you are a rehab side of this, I want you to think when someone comes in, is the activity or sport they're coming in with actually good for them? And I've read some studies online, you know, you always have to look online, who, who wrote the study? But if you saw someone walking down the street, taking their arm and whipping it very fast with a lot of force, um, you would probably say, well, that person's going to hurt themselves. But when you give them six inches of dirt and a baseball glove, you say, oh, well, that's okay. That's baseball pitcher. But you have to really look at it as though is the act of throwing good for you and is the rehab that you're actually presenting to them, is it trying to make them a better thrower or is it trying to protect them from not hurting themselves from throwing? And that's the same with gymnastics above as you, I put that slide in there. So pitchers and baseball players wouldn't think I was just picking on them. So there's many sports, but you have to ask yourself, is there a potential for damage? And what is my rehab program really going to be looking like? Um, I'll say that nobody ever puts a limit on your broccoli and asparagus, but we are going to put a limit on your throwing because it isn't necessarily good for you. Dr. Murray, who's the head of orthopedic and sports medicine here at Children's, I remember at a talk with her one time in which she said to um, the audience was, um, she said, the best way to decrease ACLs in soccer players is not to have them play soccer. And, you know, she was saying that tongue in cheek in jest. But at the same time, if you think of it, there's one unfortunate valgus twist in soccer, which isn't part of the game, which can cause an ACL injury. But in baseball, every pitch, which is part of the game, has the force to cause damage. 
Sometimes people say, well, how much damage? Um, Gill did study on it to show that the act of throwing is almost as much force as dislocating your shoulder, but having the braking system, the dynamic part of the, um, of the rotator cuff and having the, uh, the static part of the labrum to, uh, to prevent you from doing that. But oh, time and time again, Lynn found that radiologically over time, that is going to cause damage to the shoulder joint and to the elbow. You know, did we have it right way back when? Um, overhand throwers um, were outlawed until 1884. So um, it's kind of interesting to watch that um, they say Abner Doubleday didn't necessarily create baseball, but you wonder if they had it right back then that you should have just continued to do it with um, underhand. And, and without a doubt, we've seen many, many less injuries in the softball world um, with women throwing underhand as opposed to men throwing overhand. So we have susceptible injuries to the youth and adolescent, to the elbow that you do not see with the adult. And that's because I always like when I see Dr. McKaylee and Dr. Coker over the years has always have a slide that says that, you know, young people are not little adults. And so what ends up happening is the growth plates in the elbow and in the shoulder, the apophysis in the elbow and the um, epiphysis in the shoulder create um, issues when you're stressing them and you end up injuring them first because those are, as Dr. Beasley said, the weak link in the chain. So medial epicondylitis, Dr. Beasley just went over that, aka little league elbow. Um, but what I want you to think of as the rehab specialist, what type of tissue is this? Well, apophysis, bone, joint. So you want to think of what is the healing time? And am I really going to make a difference in my rehab by trying to do a lot of noxious deep massage to the elbow? Um, should I be leaving that structure alone and maybe be looking at some of the other structures that could be um, strengthened or maybe stretched to help put less stress on that area once that structure is healed? So how long is it going to take? Well, as Dr. Beasley said, about three months. I, I don't think they should call it little league elbow. I think they should call it probably Babe Ruth elbow because to be honest with you, usually what you find is the athlete primarily I will see in my last 30 years of doing this, that when someone comes in, at what age does it happen the most? It's actually when they turn 13 to 14, when they made the transition from the 45 um, foot mound to the 60 foot mound. And that's just a lot more stress. You can understand that all of a sudden you have this person who really hasn't physiologically changed all that much. And they were probably a really good athlete at throwing at 45 feet. We all know that kid, oh, Johnny, he was really good. What happened to him? Oh, when he got to Babe Ruth, he just couldn't even, you know, kind of get it to the mound as well as he used to in, in Little League. And um, very often when you used to call those players the dark throwers because they could throw with just their arm. Whereas really what you have to do is go through the whole kinematic chain and try to strengthen their core as well as their lower extremities. Let's look at it. Roger Clemens and CC Sabathia, all these guys that have those big butts and big legs, those are the guys that stay in the league the longest. So cause of little league elbow, as we know, it's the flexor um, pronator mass, which attaches to the elbow at the medial epicondyle, which is going through growth changes, which is pretty cool if you think of it. I mean, that is adjusting as our bones are growing long, our apophysis is helping to um, achieve the proper length of our tendon muscle junction. Um, in some studies, it's been shown that the apophysis is five times weaker. And that's why, as Dr. Beasley said earlier, that you see the person end up pulling at the apophysis instead of the UCL. But once that bone solidifies in, then the UCL is the next target um, it's the same stressors, but it's just a different time in the person's life as to what gets damaged. Capitellum on the outside. Um, as a rehab specialist, if someone comes in and they say that they have pain on the outside of their elbow and they're a baseball or a thrower, or even a gymnast, um, realize that at a young adolescent teenage years, that is probably not lateral epicondylitis. Don't have that kid sitting there if they haven't been diagnosed by a doctor yet and doing six to 12 weeks of therapy for lateral epicondylitis and you're letting them continue to do activities um, through pain. And it's actually uh, usually capitellum um, irritation or OCD. Uh, causes, again, the as Dr. Beasley said earlier, the valgus of the inside of the elbow which causes the little league or Babe Ruth elbow, um, causes the um, pinching on the outside, which will cause compression uh, where the radial head um, and the uh, humerus meet. So again, um, the same holds true for your shoulder injuries. So what ends up happening is that the adult side, um, adults will get torn rotator cuffs, um, they will get 
more often than not, GERD will affect you all through your years. Um, but at the younger age, you're going to have little lead shoulder because again, what happens is the growth plate of the long bones, how long does it take two to six months uh, to heal? Little lead to Babe Ruth, usually age is the greatest age we see this happen. Um, the person is starting to develop, I would say, the muscles of a man, but they have the bones of a boy or a bones of a girl, depending. And what ends up happening is that is the weak link. Causes of little league shoulder. Again, that um, Dr. Beasley had the same picture. This kid's face is great. Um, and you can see him falling off the mound to the left, valgusing his elbow to the right, opening up that shoulder. I hope this kid... Uh, Got the, a strike on that pitch because he is trying with all his might. And then GERD, um, you know, and GERD has gotten a lot of press. Um, as Dr. Beasley, I think, put it, I think we have the same slide also on the range of motion. That, um, but with GERD, what you want to really think of is this overall lack of internal rotation relative to the whole 180 degrees of the shoulder. And, and we do, that's what we see. And Reinhold did some really good studies to show that it happens. It, it just keeps happening. So it's almost as though picture if you would dig in a ditch in the backyard and over time your low back would get tight. Well, the same holds true that if you go out and pitch, you're also going to end up getting tight in your low back. I mean, I'm sorry, in your shoulder because you just stress the shoulder and the brakes of the shoulder. Um, basically, the posterior rotator cuff muscles, the um, the capsule itself, um, but it's been shown more than it's less capsular and more uh, soft tissue muscular because it, it, it happens over and over each time you throw. Um, we've been trying to gather data now to show the same way you might look at the quadricep being about one third naturally stronger than the hamstring. We're seeing that the rotator cuff or your external rotators, if you will, are about one third weaker than your internal rotators on your non-affected side. So there's this deficit. Whoever made us probably didn't want us to throw baseballs because our shoulder really, it's almost thinking that if you think of your anterior shoulder throwing muscles as the gas pedal, and you think of your posterior shoulder muscles as the brakes, uh, and the, the, the dynamic muscular or the static stabilizers, however you wanna look at it, but it, it usually seems to be when we strength test someone, from their internal rotators to the external rotators, especially at the 90-90 level, up at the higher throwing levels, uh, that they have about a one-third natural deficit. So that's something to think about that, um, you know, some studies show do we even want to strengthen the um, internal rotators. But in this case here with GERD, I want you to think that your baseball players, your throwers, your softball players, they're going to get this all the time. So uh, in terms of tightness, so have stretching the posterior shoulder be part of their routine, but beware. Studies have now shown that we went GERD crazy trying to stretch out the back of the shoulder. And what happened was people were actually getting posterior impingements because they were doing such aggressive posterior shoulder stretching. So what I would recommend that you have the athlete do is when they lie on their side, have them roll back at about 45 degrees. And stretch in moderation. Um, Reinald did some studies also to show that the crossover stretch is just as effective at stretching out the uh, posterior uh, shoulder. I still believe that the sideline uh, sleeper stretch roll back at 45 degrees has better um, ability to stretch out the shoulder than the crossover stretch. I feel that the athlete very typically um, will compensate by rotating their upper body. So beware of that. Um, but this is the exact same slide that Mike had earlier. Um, now, if we look at it, what I'd want you to try to differentiate, well, first, as Dr. McKaylee always says, you have to have a diagnosis. So when your young athlete comes in, I recommend send them to the physician because they can send them for an x-ray and we can't. Um, and you want to know whether this is you're treating someone for GERD uh, a tight shoulder or you're uh, treating them for a, uh, actually a growth plate issue. Um, and what you'll see, and I've empirically seen, meaning time and time again, but I haven't done a study, is that you'll find that little league shoulder is grossly um, a deficit in internal rotation. So if you put that person sideline as though you were assessing their internal rotation, it can be as great as 60 degrees and it hurts 
to try to do a sleeper or internal rotation stretch. Do not force that. What I have found over the years and what I want to gather data on on this is what I call the squeeze test. If you just go over to the athlete, as you see in that young guy in the middle there, and you just squeeze right below the deltoid, right above the, right at the bicep tendon almost, and you squeeze the shoulder, the athlete will say, wow, that hurts. Whereas when you do it on the unaffected side, it doesn't. And when you look at the picture to the right, the gentleman stretching, who's much older than someone who's gonna really shoulder, um, they usually are, if there is a deficit and we call it GERD, it's usually you know about that 15 to 20, maybe 30 degrees of motion, but little league shoulder, beware of that 60 degree deficit. Um, and if they haven't gotten a x-ray yet or been seen by a physician, I would recommend that you send them because you cannot detect that on your own. Uh, it also works really well on the ankle and the wrist if you're looking at growth plates. I can't tell you how many times as a soccer coach for over 20 years on the sidelines of a game, a kid falls on an outstretched arm or and did it three weeks ago and the parents like, is he just um, slacking on his wrist here or are they slacking on an inversion ankle twist and they're saying, gee, this is taking longer. If you just squeeze above the ankle or the wrist, it will be a very sharp pain. So again, as a kind of clinical tool, the squeeze test um, works very well for the shoulder, ankle, and the wrist. Now, again, sometimes we want to make sure if there's moms and dads out there listening, um, you can do everything right. I've had dads almost be in tears. I've had moms be in tears. You can do everything right, but if your child is that man boy, who comes in who has a almost a full beard at 11 and he's got um, you know veins popping out of his arms he could be throwing the best form but the act of throwing is just very very forceful so don't be too hard on yourself if you find that your athlete did everything right you sent him to the pitching coach and you had him eating the right food sometimes just the act of throwing can create um, the stress itself so what are the ingredients to rehab uh, throwing injuries? What we want to think of is, we'll rehab strength and flexibility at the right time. So if someone is an ongoing healing stress fracture and the doctors have sent you to you at two weeks, you have to realize that this could be another anywhere from six to 10 more weeks before this athlete is healed. So you can't do too vigorous of strengthening, but you can look to other parts of the body to strengthen. Initially, stop throwing. Um, Initially, that should probably be number one. You have to stop throwing. And then at some point, you want to return to throwing program. And then a pitching assessment is always good. Um, Miguel will go over that. But at the same time, um, there's an article here that I'll give you the title of, which I find gives you like five great pointers. And I've found that parents, coaches, um, and athletes can read it and really get a lot from it. So what you want to do as the uh, rehab specialist is first identify, is it muscle, muscular? Is it joint? Is it tendon? So you could kind of just in the injuries that I'm talking about here today, you could put GERD probably into the soft tissue category. So it's not gonna take a long time for you to make gains with that, maybe two to six weeks. Um, at the same time, if it's little league elbow, little league shoulder, as much as we're not gonna just call it bone, but we're gonna call it um, the growth plate. So it's going to end up taking anywhere from two to three months to heal. And then last, if someone has an OCD lesion or not it's been diagnosed, um, that can take longer. It can take um, three months. It can take, even take up to six months. And then the, the, kid, the person's on the fence as to whether they're going to need surgery. So you have to be able to first identify and give the patient and family a reasonable time frame. Sometimes not the sports medicine doctors here at Children's, but especially if someone goes to a pediatrician, the pediatrician takes the bull by the horns and then sends them for the x-rays. They very often are very wishy-washy about actually the exact time frames that this athlete has to lay off. And if you set some um, goals right from the beginning, I think it's going to be easier for everybody not to think um, that they're going to get back sooner than later. Then based on the time frame of the injury, well, you can give the person rep schemes and set schemes and exercises that are according to that. So if someone has just hurt themselves, they come in two to three weeks post injury and you're giving them exercises for circulation, but not really breaking down the, the, um, the tissue. Well, that's the acute stage. I mean, Dr. Demacourt and myself have done a lot of work with this with um, basically the full body, whether it's the knee, the shoulder, or the back. And, and really we kind of categorized 
um, how you want to look at rep schemes based on healing. So when someone comes in the acute stage of healing, but you have to identify what is that tissue that's been healing, if it's muscle tendon, well, the acute stage you could say is one to two weeks. If it's the actual bone stage of a growth plate, you could say the acute stage is more like three to four weeks. And then at that point, the person can do, they can do that daily. Um, they can get into the subacute stage of activity as they start to add a little bit of resistive motion. Um, the combining multi-joint activities, then that's three to five times a week. But then once they get into the rehab stage and you're saying, okay, this person is at um, two to three months with little league shoulder, little league elbow, it's pretty um, interesting that with little league shoulder and little league elbow, the person can do more upper body and lower body, they can do complete lower body and core training, but they're, even their upper body, as long as they're not throwing a baseball, they actually do very well with exercise without any discomfort. Uh, and that rehab stage though, again, you have to, as the rehab specialist, you cannot ask these athletes as they're starting to add resistance and become stronger. You can't ask these athletes to do something every day because they're gonna be tearing their body down. It's gonna be too much. And then the sports specific um, phase comes after that. So here, this is the platform that I use in terms of giving exercises. So elbow early stage exercises, just to kind of show you. So here we have the different diags and the person can hyperlink down to it. So if we just kind of show here um, for literally elbow capitalum, this is early stage. So what I did here is I just took the exercises instead of hyperlinking down. But I just want to kind of show you. So if someone comes in and they're about two weeks, well, initially, so for example, for let's go into finger and hand flexion. So if we start with that, then what we'll do is after um, we would go after they do that, uh, two sets of 20 reps, three consecutive workouts, non-consecutive days. So we would probably let them do that up to five times a week without a problem, but then we would have them start to use some resistance as we feel they can. Then ultimately, if they can, instead of a sponge ball, we would have them use a hand gripper. Um, and then if we went into just to kind of show you the progression, I want you to think this way, is this what you do? Is if someone is actually strengthening the pronator mass, they start with active motion, but as they can do active motion, then they go on to using resistive motion. And so what you wanna think of is that every time an athlete comes into you, you're moving them up. You're making it so that they are progressing to the next level. If we take that down to early stage shoulder exercises, the same holds true down here, is that what we want to have them start to do in the early stages that we would have them start to do. Again, a lot of the exercise with little league shoulder, they can progress on quicker, but you, you know, initially you want to ask them, can you scapula squeeze? Okay, I can do that. I'm working my scapula stabilizers. If you can do scapula stabilization this way, you can do one arm row, one arm row turns into weights, weights turn into, as an alternative bands, beware of bands. Bands are very um, portable and nice to use, but with young teenagers, um, I would much rather have a functional trainer if I had the ability to, because I can keep track of weights. And every single time they come in, you wanna be moving them up. Um, and if you're not moving them up, are they really getting stronger? Um, so that is the rehab side of how we progress people. We want them to be strengthening their scapula stabilizers, their rotator cuff. We want them to be strengthening their lower extremities. I, I want to go into the fitness program in a moment. Um, and that really is the later stage for um, throwing athletes. I'm going to show you in one second here. So, but just again, do you do this? Most effective variables, are you moving your athletes up in weight? Um, are you training the unaffected side? You should train the unaffected side because ultimately when you say someone's 100%, are they really 100% of what? Well, they, they should be 100% of their other side. And if you're not comparing that, how do you know? And typically the dominant side is 20% stronger. So a throwing athlete, usually the throwing athletes, um, cuff, rotator cuff, scapular stabilizers are 20% stronger than they're non. And if you're never comparing the unaffected side, how do you know that? High reps are better. Um, DeLorme did three sets of 10 reps years ago and showed that if you do three sets of 10, that's basically 75% of what you can do one rep. That's the only reason why you said three sets of 10. But really, if you look at the data, really uh, studies by Grimsby and Coverts, um, high reps are better. 15 to 20 reps in a set during the injury phase is much better for tendon bone healing junction. Two sets is just as good as three if you're working to failure. 
And then circuiting the weights is also good. But I ask all the athletes, uh, all the rehab specialists to do who have worked with me for years, as I say, go through one set of every exercise with the athlete, make sure their form is good. That way you got through all the exercises, but then have them do the second set. And that makes it so the creatine phosphate stores are, are replenished. But at the same time, as the rehab specialist, you got through every exercise at least once with them. Stop the offending throwing uh, activity, which is throwing. Um, so return to throwing program, you want to do that. Scott Waugh, who is one of my colleagues over the years, who works with the Red Sox now, me and him put a return to throwing program together uh, a few years back. We find that this is, you don't need a physics degree. A lot of the return to throwing programs are so intense and in depth, really. It's a, it's a touch point. It's something to look at. You did X amount of throws. LL here means little league. Um, but this is a six week program. Sometimes we knock it down to three weeks if the athlete is healed and we feel. So we just, instead of having them do each phase three times a week, we just have them do each phase twice a week. Um, and then they get to flat ground throwing and then ultimately return to pitching off the mound. So this is also um, what we use when we're instructing athletes on that. So the return to throwing program, and then this great article here. Now, um, and I, I would ask you to get this article, have it, give it out to all your baseball players, softball players. It's just really good in terms of uh, uh, form. But Miguel is going to go into this even greater. Um, so if you can have the ability to have your pitching analysis done, that's great. And then uh, how do you prevent injuries? Well, again, pitch counts. Uh, LittleLeague.org um, has a really good website um, to tell you um, what's the safest. Again, is is it, is, it, is it the safest? Yes, less volume is better, so keeping track. AAU, I kid around, I call it almost always unable to play because they ask these kids to play three or four games on a weekend. Um, beware, usually I find most pitchers who get hurt on the weekend, it's the first game of the weekend. I think these young teenagers get up, they're half asleep. The baseball coach is finishing his coffee and he's looking to see if he has all his bats and balls. And the next thing, the kid's throwing 45 pitches in the first inning. So um, again, pitch count is probably the most important to prevent injuries. Again, a good article or to have a Miguel to show you how to have good form. And then the elephant in the room, baseball players overall lack fitness. Um, what's the worst day for a baseball player in gym class? The day they're gonna run the mile. So let's face it that some of these athletes, whether it's CC Sabathia or uh, Wells here, who used to be with the Sox and the Yankees, but uh, is baseball really address strength, flexibility, and cardio? Um, so what we do is after the first three to six weeks of doing the intermediate exercises, what I do is everybody gets on um, this program here. This is the platform again that I use. So the person will come in, they'll go on to a platform of exercises. So what, is it, what does it entail? As Mike Beasley said earlier, the scapula stabilizing muscles. So we have them do a row motion. Um, if they have the luxury of having either a functional trainer or weight machines, we'll have them go to weight machines, um, lat pull downs, um, little league shoulder sometimes is a function of a person being round shoulders. So doing their scapula stabilizers, lats, and then ultimately they're a 90, 90 position. This is internal rotation, as you can see. Um, some specialists will say you don't need to do internal rotation, but um, since the internal rotator is part of the uh, rotator cuff, which depresses the humeral head when raising your arm, I do have them strengthen their internal rotators. And if you can make them a little bit of a better pitcher, um, faster pitcher, that's not a bad idea. You have your scaption, your external rotation sideline, and at 90-90, you have your scapula stabilizing exercises here, your I's, your T's, your Y's. Um, Again, I find throwers 10, I just feel like 10 exercises, I think it's too redundant. And with these young athletes, they only have a bandwidth of so much. So usually when they first come in the first day, I'm showing them their scapula stabilizers through a row motion and their cuff exercises. Then if I deem them uh, you know, physiologically responsible enough to add in more scapula, stabili sta scapula stabilizing exercises, I will. But I typically uh, have to make that judgment as to how old they are. I will have them work their anterior muscles, but I won't do it with um, doorway stretching as Mike, uh, Dr. Beasley said earlier, but more so I don't think it's a bad idea to work their um, 
the anterior pec muscles, internal rotators, as long as you're not putting too much stress on the anterior capsule. This comes back down to their forearm exercises, their pronator um, flexor masses, their wrist flexors. I'll have them work their elbow exercises as well, whether it's um, reverse curls, bicep curls, um, and hammer curls, as well as triceps. Again, I'm making judgments as to how responsible some of these kids are, what age they are. I'm working their hand flexors, looking at opposition. Does someone with any kind of ulnar nerve palsy need to do some uh, opposition motions? Then we get into core. Is the person working their core? So we can do that through rotation. We can work the posterior exercises. We can work their lumbar exercises. Remember the low back is a core exercise. Everyone always thinks of abs. And then ultimately we'll have them work their lower extremities um, instead of just working their exercise, such as I like to do lateral lunges, um, but at the same time, if it's a baseball pitcher, having good balance and being able to do your lateral lunges as if you were pitching. This young guy is actually going to UPenn um, and he was a perennial patient of ours. So he said he would love to be in our videos. Um, so, and then ultimately with these young athletes, what is also an issue is that young athletes get tight. So if their inflexibilities are of their finger flexors, you can only imagine that if your fingers um, are getting longer, your ulnar is getting longer, your humerus is getting longer, then your finger flexors are getting tighter. So we'll have them stretch their finger flexors as well as the regular typical finger flexor stretch, but this way also. Um, we'll have them work their sleeper stretch at the right time, not for little league shoulder until it's healed, but we have them lean back at 45 degrees. And we'll work also, which we like to do, is we try to have them also understand that they need to do cardio. So we have them do a cardiovascular arm of this, um, where they end up picking three to five days a week, they pick a cardio exercise, because baseball is not a cardio exercise. Um, and then also, um, we're monitoring it each time they come in and it really turns into a fitness program. So your physical therapy, your athletic training should turn into a fitness program where you're working both sides, higher reps, and you're trying to make sure that the injured structure side is as strong, if not stronger than the unaffected side. Alrighty, I did a lot. I got through it. Um, and then let me just go back to the original here, let me just move this. All right, oh, let me just get out of there and then back to here. Oh, and then I am good with that. All righty, Stacy. Hold on one second. Did you lose me? Nope. Okay. Right. Uh, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Yes, I will stop sharing. Stop share. There you go. Sorry about that. If I went fast, I was a little off on time. I didn't want to go over. If anyone has any questions, you can submit them for Carl at the bottom. We'll give a few minutes for some to roll in. Carl, can you see the Q&A with the two pop up at the bottom of your screen? Yeah. Are those two for me or those previous for Dr. Beasley? Nope, those are for you. Well, one just says, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, very helpful. We're in the rehab process to address lower extremity deficits that is contributing to injury. Um, I will, literally from day one, when an athlete comes in, I mean, let's face it, if they're in the acute stage of little league shoulder or little league elbow, you can only do so much with them. So this, um, we call it the shoulder racket throwing sport program. So they are receiving that day one. So they're working their core, they're working their lower extremities, and then we're giving them the early stage exercises for their shoulders as their shoulder injury, their bony fracture, if you will, stress fractures healing. So that is happening day one. And then let me see if there's anything else. Um, we are in the review, okay. When building a strength program, how many times a week should athletes be doing mobility, stability, and soft tissue work? Um, 
Okay, that is a good question. What I would say is that um, a, a strength program, if you're using the true word strength where they're tearing their body down, then they can't do a strength program more than three days a week. And ultimately, once they get into the full 100% um, strength program, they shouldn't be doing a body part more than twice a week. Maybe they could be doing it three, but really twice. Um, and I, I kind of forgot the other part of it because that question left. But um, so the strength program, if they are doing core and they're doing lower extremity strengthening, they should only be doing that no more than two to three days a week. Their flexibility studies show that they could be doing flexibility three to five days a week. And soft tissue work, I hate to say it to you guys, but the insurance companies have taken away ice, electrical stim, and heat. And the next thing coming down the aisle, guys, is going to be they're going to take away soft tissue work. There's some studies to show that massaging someone, it feels good, it increases circulation, but does it actually do long-term tissue changes? If you rub someone today, does that tissue change stay there tomorrow? Um, there's no studies, and physical therapists don't really do a very good job of collecting data at all about it. So I would say that um, I, I do massage. I think it's a great tool to make people feel good. But, um, and I do that day one, uh, depending on the structure. I don't start rubbing a stress fracture, but if they have uh, GERD, if they have scapular thoracic pain, I'll, I'll do massage. But um, long-term, um, I think it's just a transient thing. And then what is the typical length of time you see a throwing patient visit wise? So with the program that I just showed you online, I will see them typically, again, because they have a stress fracture and that's gonna take time to heal. I'll see them once every two to three weeks. Um, once they get into the fitness stage and they wanna learn more about the full program, if they wanted to come in once a week um, and then I have them do the program on their own twice a week, they could do that. But um, why are you gonna have someone come in I mean, if they have the time, the money, and the ability to do it, but if you're going to ask some kid to have his mom leave work and bring you there and pay a $50 copay and they have a stress fracture, I would say be, beware of asking them. It's, it's a big ask nowadays. So I would say that maximum maybe once a week um, and then minimum maybe once every two or three weeks. And then um, do you use the same parameters for throwing program for softball players as you would for baseball players? So the return to throwing program, yes, I use the same numbers because I don't think there's good data points out there to show um, the, vo uh, so, but we'll use the little league um, level because it's the smaller mound, uh, smaller um, distance. So we use the little league parameters for softball players. Good question. We can give it another few seconds. And I know someone, um, Miguel had said he could comment on one of the questions about building a strength program. So I'm sure he'll touch on that in a, another minute. Great. I think we'll move over to Miguel. And again, if more questions come through, feel free to drop them in there. We can address them at the end or like Dr. Beasley did, Carl can um, respond by typing an answer too. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thanks. You ready, Miguel? I am ready. I don't know if you can see me. Perfect. All right. Good. <clears throat> All right. Stacy, can you hear me? Yes. Double check. Me. Perfect. All right. So, um, as Carl and Dr. Beasley have touched, a lot of uh, a good portion of this, I'm going to be just kind of going over briefly, um, just kind of touching on giving my couple pointers on uh, a couple of those things. Um, we'll talk about programming, we'll talk about uh, throwing programs, I'll get into the more specifics, as well as just the things that I look for in terms of biomechanics um, in overhead throwers um, in general. Um, so my role here um, is like any other athletic trainer, um, having that ex uh, athletic training expertise, strong evaluation skills, understanding the, uh, the functional anatomy, biomechanics, kinemechanics, kinemechanics um, 
origins, insertions, everything. Uh, for me, baseball is kind of my passion. I play baseball. I've worked in baseball. I've done everything baseball. So um, this is kind of where, where I excel and I really can put a lot of my effort towards. Um, and looking for uh, kind of the bigger picture. Um, why did the injury occur? what the injury is, not only looking at, say, there's a shoulder injury or an elbow injury, but looking throughout the body, looking at the uh, thoracic mobility, um, lumbar spine, looking at hip mobility, knee, ankle mobility, especially, um, and just kind of looking at everything there. Um, as Dr. Beasley and Carl have, have touched on, just common shoulder injuries, shoulder impingement, rotator cuff tear, Little league shoulder, biceps tendonitis. We have GERD. Um, I, I have had a lot of success in, in kind of treating GERD. Many times from my experiences, GERD is, yes, we see it, but we, we can get rid of that. And it's usually coming from some other portion, whether it's the pec, whether it's the lat, whether it's the rhomboid, posterior shoulder, subscap, something's there that's uh, causing that, as well as just kind of the increased number of pitches that they might be throwing. So being able to maintain that throughout the season. Um, in common elbow injuries, we have the classic UCL sprain, tear or rupture, um, ulnar nerve entrapment, uh, which is very common as well, and little league elbow. So that has already been touched on. Um, and kind of going, at, so after they see Carl, um, what, to, what to consider um, once that thrower is cleared? Um, so you want to ideally keep building, keep maintaining that strength that they had gained from that physical therapy. Um, in the previous in injury, rotator and upper, upper rotator cuff and upper back. Um, from there, when they come to see me, we talk about programming, but I usually give them a whole program, just kind of ramping it up. Um, and then we also throw in that core and lower body program. I use a lot of... Um, payoff pressing, anti-rotational exercises to really kind of help with staying against the force that they're putting against. Um, and we'll kind of get on uh, with that during the uh, interventions. Um, building and maintaining scapular mobility. So that's something I really, really harp on, making sure that when we are examining them, we are looking at the mobility in their scapula. Um, if they are symmetrical on the left and right side, um, if there's a delayed kind of uh, scapular upward rotation, downward rotation, retraction, protraction in that scapula. We want it to be even. Most of the time when I get fatigued shoulders or uh, pitchers who um, have thrown too much or, or coming from an injury, usually that affected side either stops and hitches or is very delayed in kind of that upward and downward uh, rotation of that scapula. Um, so making sure that we are addressing that and we'll go over some exercises for that as well. Total arc uh, for the range of motion for internal and external rotation. So a lot of studies have come out recently being between 170 and 185 is kind of that golden mark. Um, I would say 175 to 185 would be a little bit better. Anything below or above that has seen an increased rise in, in shoulder and elbow injuries um, because they either are not mo mobile enough or they are too mobile. So that's kind of the golden number in there. Um, I usually try, I usually say 178 to 182 is kind of my gold number um, that I'm looking for. I'm trying to get people too, as well as flexion and extension of the shoulder. Um, taking in consideration their position. So each position um, has kind of a different motion and arm slot to go in. Pitchers and outfielders are a little longer and kind of that arc around, while infielders are more short arms. Same thing with uh, catchers as well, because they have to be quick. So understanding the position and how they are taught to throw and the things that you're looking for in that throw as well. If they're coming back from an injury, that length of time they haven't thrown and the length of time that they have until their season starts. As you know, a lot of uh, baseball players are mental. It's a big mental game. They want to be ready for the season. So if they're cleared in the winter, they want to be ready for day one. So taking all of that into consideration, just listening to their concerns, um, and you'll build kind of your, your strength program as well as your throwing program, return the play program around that as well. Um, so the way I like to do things, uh, example of programs. So these are just kind of things I do. So shoulder program is a combination of that strength and stability program that I like to give 
on day one um, from when I see them. Usually it's, it's light weights. Carl went over a bunch of exercise, standing T, standing Ys, um, internal external rotation. Uh, we'll have some, uh, I'll have an example here in a minute. Um, and then a lot of table exercises. I like to do prone table T's, Y's, I's, W's, um, to really kind of engage that, that posterior musculature um, and, and rotator cuff. Um, and we'll see that here. Tubing program, which uh, I like to do in between days of those, those uh, strength and stability program days, is just a lighter day with all bands. Um, pitchers love bands. Um, if you tell them to do band work, they'll be all for it. Um, and it's just a lighter day. You can do, like, like Carl said, less sets, more reps. I, I like 12 to 15 reps um, with band, band work and about two sets. I think that's kind of the magic number there. Um, moving down into that scapular and thoracic mobility program, very, very important. I think it's oftentimes overlooked. Um, scapular mobility, like I had spoken earlier, I think is, is arguably the most important thing to look at as it is kind of that connection point between our trunk and lower body and our shoulder and elbow. Having good scapular mechanics is really important in terms of just making sure that the injury is, is minimize um, and that we're properly engaging that energy and, and rotation um, into our shoulders. Uh, a good re return to throwing program, we'll go over that as well. And then I like to incorporate a lot of rhythmic stability exercises. I have a lot of pitchers who um, and throwers who are great with the band work, are great with kind of the uh, strength table exercises, they're very strong, but the second you get them uh, supine on a table and you start moving their arm around, they can't do anything to stabilize. So really getting their rotator cuff to engage and stabilize that shoulder joint is gonna go a long way in terms of their shoulder health. Um, so some, some exercises, shout out to Wentworth. I know some of you guys are here, um, took these a long time ago. Um, but some things that I like to harp on are things that Carl had already went over, standing TheraBand, external rotation, internal rotation. What I, like to, what I like to do, so I know a lot of people use towels and things in between their shoulder. I like to kind of use my arm as a fulcrum um, and kind of rest my arm there. So studies have shown um, that when the arm is in, scapula, in the scapular plane, you are maximizing the amount of shoulder uh, stability and rotator cuff activation as, as possible. Um, so that kind of shows the most benefits in that, in that um, plane um, in terms of gaining and maintaining that strength and stability. Standing Ws to really engage that, the scapular retraction um, as well as external rotation. Standing T, standing Ys, full can, uh, X, and we go sidelining, it's a rotation, prone Ts, prone Ys, prone Ws. Um, you can really get uh, into it and really be creative with, with the athletes, but these are kind of the plain um, first, first day exercise that I like to give my people, um, prone Ts, prone Ys. Getting into the scapular mobility, the two um, exercises that I see the best results in terms of kind of maintaining that proper posture in the scapular mechanics, our scapular wall slides. So making sure they're up against that wall flush, touching everything from their low back, upper back, shoulders, elbows, forearms, wrists, hands, um, and getting up as high as you can without anything popping off that, that wall. The second that something pops off that wall, we're gonna come back down. Um, and that shows not only the mobility in our, in our lats, but also in our scapula. And a lot of times too, what, if we're delayed in that scapula rota upward rotation, that wall helps to stabilize and it normalizes that rotation. Um, so first thing I do um, is get them on that wall. From there, I like to go into a scapular flexion wall slide um, facing the wall. I use a band around them. I try, I tell them the cue to keep their shoulder blades back and down and then get up as high as you can, keeping your forearms parallel. Um, and that really engages kind of the, the, uh, the scapular rotation, upward rotation, and believe it or not, protraction as well. Um, I've had a lot of success in terms of this. Um, dealing with wing, uh, scapular wing, um, if they can get, they can do this every day. Um, and I usually see within two weeks that that scapular wing has greatly decreased. 
Um, as, as we get in the season, um, stretching, joint mobilization, soft tissue work as an athletic trainer um, become very important. Um, I found that with dynamic stretching, it, you'll get the most benefits, you'll get the best feedback from your athletes as well. One thing to know is when we get, when we're doing our dynamic stretching, um, going into external rotation, many of our throwers will have that excess external rotation and, and slightly limited internal rotation as they, as they throw more. So doing our passes through in that external rotation should be limited. I'd say four to five passes at most. If there is a restriction in that external rotation, it's oftentimes in that bicep or in that pec and kind of doing an active release or passive release there can often get that without kind of yanking on their shoulder to get them to external rotation. Going into internal rotation, same thing, especially after pitchers throw or throwers throw, we get into that internal rotation. Oftentimes we see that humeral head pop forward, making sure that we're stabilizing that down. And I find that um, doing the, the posterior inferior joint mob when that happens, oftentimes gets them into that correct positioning. And you do a couple passes with that joint mobilization posterior inferiorly, and they get that internal rotation back fairly quickly. Um, if they are feeling a kind of pinch, I know a lot of when you stretch a lot of uh, upper extremity athletes, they feel like, oh, I have a pinch in kind of the back of their shoulder. Attacking that pinch in that direction with that joint mobilization oftentimes gets rid of that pinch as well. Um, usually that's caused from that, that uh, excess throwing, the scar tissue and, and things start to build up in there. So kind of breaking through that scar tissue with that joint mobilization can go a long way in kind of maintaining that, that external rotation, internal rotation range of motion. Um, Carl had gone over the sleeper stretch. He hit it right on the nail. Um, doing the sleeper stretch in, in a, incorrectly can be very detrimental. Um, so getting them into that 45 uh, degree mark sideline um, and making sure that their, their shoulder isn't popping up into that kind of impingement zone, making sure they're doing that correctly. Soft tissue work, uh, working on the lats, biceps, triceps, pecs, and, and upper traps for, for throwers can go a long way. Um, biceps and, and lats are the most common, um, I would say, that that kind of tighten up or feel sore from the pitcher if they are throwing correctly. So making sure that you kind of do what we call a flush um, to just to kind of make sure that they are in a good spot there. As, as we know, as I said earlier, pitchers are very, and throwers are mental, baseball players are mental. Um, so making them feel like they're being listened to and having their things addressed is really, really important. Um, getting into our throwing program. Um, so things to consider um, are kind of where you're starting. Um, if they are coming back from an injury, if they are not injured. So they can kind of be interchangeable. Um, what I like to do is if they're coming back from a, an injury to kind of take multiple days off in between or doing every other day of throwing. And we'll see that um, here shortly. Um, creating a calendar for your player or uh, coach can be very valuable so they know where they are in kind of that uh, throwing return to play uh, program. Um, I usually tell them, hey, if, if you're coming back from an injury and you're excessively sore or feel pain after throwing, take the next day off and repeat that same phase um, going forward. Gradually increasing the amount of throws and gradually increasing their amount of intensity um, and letting that come naturally is really, really important. A lot of times when they're feeling good, they just want to yank and, and throw 100% right away. But making sure that in that program, you say, hey, we're using our legs where we're throwing nice and easy. There's going to be an arc on the ball. Let the, let the uh, intensity come naturally. Um, as we kind of get further along in that program, you can be like, okay, try to throw a, a, in a straight line or um, really engage those legs. And then you can start to incorporate some, some uh, pitching mechanics and, and, and getting them on the mound. Um, the other thing that I like to give uh, everybody is just kind of principles to kind of abide by. Um, this is more for the healthy, healthy uh, thrower, um, reducing that soreness, building the strength and endurance. 
Ideally, ideally, you want to throw before doing any shoulder or upper body workout to make sure that we are properly using our mechanics. We're not throwing while fatigued um, because this is the time that we want to build up that endurance. We don't want to be fatigued while throwing. Um, any throws above 90 feet, this is what I like to tell my athletes to be done with a crow hop or replacing feet, side shuffle, anything of the sorts to kind of get their legs involved so they're not throwing all arm. Like I had said, let, let the intensity come naturally. Um, and then focus on just getting your arm moving. This isn't anything to kind of, uh, no, nobody's watching, nobody's gonna cut you from the team, I like to say. So just kind of take that, take it at your own pace, okay? Um, so we're gonna kind of go quickly go through our throwing progression um, that I like to, uh, this is just an example. So starting them with two sets of 25 throws at 60 feet, this is just an example. And, kind of repeating that day. This is for somebody who was coming back from an injury, repeating, if they can give me two days of, of no pain or no soreness, we move on. Um, and I think that's kind of what most uh, collegiate and, and professional teams do, um, just kind of monitor the situation. You're not always gonna be there uh, while they're throwing, but being honest with themselves, um, if they aren't there, their, their parents or whoever they're with, okay? So as we see by day five, we, we're continuing to build on that. We're getting up to 90 feet, just one set of 25. Um, day 13, we add another set of 120 feet going forward. We're repeating that day multiple. Skipping ahead, usually for me, my magic number is starting them 45 to 60 days before um, the, the season starts. So really getting them the first month just to kind of get the arm moving. Second month, we get their get them on the mound or flat ground and, and start kind of refining their pitching mechanics. Um, increasing there, usually just fastballs, day 33, fastballs 50, and this is where, where I had said to let the intensity come naturally, 50% intensity fastballs only. We're not going crazy, nobody's watching, um, and everything is as tolerated upping the intensity as we're going, we're keeping everything the same in terms of long toss and throwing and the amount that we're throwing. Um, and then eventually incorp incorporating breaking balls um, and getting ready for that first day of, of spring baseball. Um, so now getting into that, that, the analysis. So here, what we do is we do 2D and 3D analysis. So I'm just gonna kind of combine the two. 2D analysis, what we do is, uh, take a look at everybody um, in the slow motion, uh, extreme slow motion. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of break down a video there. And then a 3D analysis is kind of like making a video game. We put a bunch of dots on it. We get a thousands of data points and then we can really hone in and kind of connect the dots between their 2D analysis and 3D analysis on kind of shoulder pain, elbow pain, any other biomechanical in insufficiencies that they might have. Um, looking at that, uh, like I said before, shoulder abduction, horizontal adduction, when you're doing kind of clinical measurements in, in a clinic, um, really, really important. Goniometry, also very important. Shoulder internal rotation um, and total arc is really important, getting between that 175 and 185, like I had spoken about. Looking at the hip internal external rotation. Hip internal external rotation, really, really important because if they're unable to get out in that stride, they're going to uh, cause a lot of other problems up that, that kinetic chain. Um, ankle dorsiflexion, looking at that mobility in the ankle, hip flexor tightness, lumbar flexion extension, T-spine mobility, and just kind of their overall, overall posture. Are they rounded? Is there a wing scapula um, looking down the body? Are, are they anterior tilted? Um, and kind of addressing all those. Um, functional measurements, so modified wall angel test. So the wall slides that we had done, um, you can get a lot of information off of that the, uh, with the mobility in their shoulders, with, with that uh, scapular upward and downward rotation and mobility. Um, wall push-up test for scapular winging. Testing their glute max. Uh, Supraspinatus and internal external rotation in terms of strength is really, really important. Probably the three that I harp on the most. Glute is really important because if they're unable to kind of push off the ground, then they're going to be able, they're going to use a lot of that, that shoulder and we want to avoid that. We want them to use kind of that kinetic chain of energy coming up. Um, typical findings. So 
clinically, we find that they have excessive external rotation, as, as Carl and, and Dr. Bizet talked about, and decreased internal rotation, so that GERD. Um, taking that time to do that soft tissue uh, work, joint mobs, really um, taking the time to do that mobility work and, and, and that shoulder programs and things like that, whatever you develop, um, are really, really important in kind of maintaining that. Thomas, uh, Thomas test is usually positive, I'd say probably for most of my athletes, but especially in, in my uh, baseball players. Um, and that kind of decreases their stride, um, which we, wanna, we want them to get to 85 to 100% of their body height. Um, tight calves as well. Functional, um, we usually see a lot of scapular wing, especially in those younger athletes that the uh, inability to kind of keep that posterior musculature strong for them is really difficult, especially because nowadays a lot of kids are playing a lot of video games, they're on their phone, they're constantly rounded forwards, they're not doing anything for that posterior musculature to really uh, maintain that, that strength. Um, decrease or imbalance glute strength, oftentimes their throwing side a balanced leg is stronger and their landing leg is not. Um, and we want that to be even, and we'll see that going uh, once we get into the analysis, but everything we want to be even on the left and right side, regardless. Um, there's going to always be some sort of uh, difference in terms of shoulder range of motion and strength because they are constantly throwing, um, but kind of making sure that that's as, as close as possible. All right, so data collection for our 3D, we just mark them up in, in uh, a bunch of uh, dots. We use our high-speed camera. We, we just get, get them going, um, looking at the first forward movement, foot strike, max external rotation, ball release. Um, and then for underhand, we won't really touch on the underhand, but we do that as well. We look at first forward move, movement, top of back swing, uh, foot strike, max uh, external rotation, and ball release as well. Um, what I'll... I know we won't touch on the underhand portion as much, but a lot of the things that overhand uh, throwers do under, it can be contributed to that lower as well in terms of that hip mobility, the shoulder range of motion, um, things like that. All right. So kinematic sequencing. So really important in terms of our throwing. So how are we using our legs and trunk um, before it gets up to our upper arm? As we see in that upper left corner here, we, it should be pelvis kind of comes through, trunk, upper arm, forearm. And a lot of times what we see is the inability to engage that pelvis and trunk. And it's a lot of upper arm and forearm. So as we kind of get into here, what we see is that trunk actually starts to engage first, that pelvis never does anything. So that shows me that, hey, this person is lacking that that hip separation, that hip trunk separation in order to engage uh, that core and torque um, to help that upper body from, from throwing. And what we'll see is we'll see a lot of front shoulder opening, back shoulder drag, back elbow um, drag as well. Um, and so we want really want to harp on, hey, let's get your trunk and pelvis engaged um, before we're throwing. Getting into that first forward movement. So center of mass velocity. So what we call cum, cum velocity towards home plate. So ideally, looking at that chart at the top here, we just wanted to gradually decrease to kind of show, hey, that their force is going downhill, which it is in this case. There's not a lot of research on this. We're doing a lot, we're doing much more research on it. So hopefully at some point shortly, we'll have kind of a whole research article on that. But moving down the energy angle, um, also very important. So at the top of their, their knee swing or knee drive up, we look at kind of the angle between their knee drive, their foot and home plate. Um, typically an MLB pitcher and co collegiate pitcher near 20 degrees. Um, most adolescents I would say are about 10 degrees, six to 10 degrees about, um, as they get a little bit more uh, trained and things like that, we'll see it upwards of 15. Um, but I would say nearing 20, um, is very rare, especially on flat ground. Um, but just kind of this angle right here, kind of going forwards. So are they, if the less uh, degree angle that they're at, the less that they're using their, their lower body uh, and legs to really drive forward so, towards home plate. So we want to see kind of that backside loaded heading towards home plate.
Stride length. Um, so like I said before, hip flexor and hip mobility is really, really important. Um, what we look at is can you can you get about 85 to 100 percent of your your height towards home plate? Um, oftentimes we only get to 50 or 60 percent because that hip mobility is unable to kind of get forward and land and follow through um, to really help maximize the amount of force that we're generate towards home plate. We find that kind of that that's that that sweet spot um, looking at at that slow motion camera. And it, you, if you don't have kind of the data points there, just kind of using that camera, maybe take a ruler, take take uh, the height of that athlete and then turn it sideways and do they get to about 80 to 90% of that. Right. Um, timing from top of knee swing to foot strike, usually within one second. Um, I would say most uh, get close to that one second, anything less or anything more can be detrimental, especially more because they're out of sync. And what we'll see kind of in our, in our video analysis is if they are uh, early, everything closes off too early. Um, and then if they're late, their front shoulder opens early um, and, the, and the back, back arm comes through late. Okay. Yeah. Hurry up here. Uh, elbow positioning. So we talked about front, front side, back side being symmetrical. So we really want to harp on keeping both sides symmetrical and, and strong together because uh, the front side actually does more than we think. Holding on to our glove side, we only have a ball on the back side. We need to be slightly stronger. It has to control everything in that front side. Our throwing side has to control everything from the backside, if that makes sense. And we'll see that as well. But usually at the top of the arm swing, being within that 10 degrees or, or close to that 10 degrees is really important. A lot of times what we see is kind of somebody way up here, somebody way out here, and they're, they're, some, uh, they're out of whack there. And we usually see kind of that front shoulder open up. Um, hip trunk separation, being at about 40 degrees uh, is great. Um, You'll, you can see that clearly and we'll, we're, I'm actually gonna fast forward into the video so we can really get to that um, fast forward intervention. First forward movement, so anti-rotational exercises, single leg balance, glute lower body exercises. So pay off presses, single leg hip thrusts, especially for those glutes. Eccentric calf raises are very, very beneficial. At foot strike, dynamic balancing, being able to follow through on one foot and be controlled is really important having core stability going through as well and using those explosive exercises to really go. So ice, ice skaters with an unstable surface or, or holding onto a med ball, really exploding, suitcase carries, lateral lunges, things like that. Um, max external rotation. I'm just gonna skip through this because we're going to go over it with the video. Um, timing between ball release, between 0.25 and 0.35 seconds um, is, is that ideal. Um, from foot strike to ball release. I would say younger athletes are a little higher than that. So just kind of making sure that they're coming through together. Um, and oftentimes younger athletes are delayed with that because their foot strike goes, their front arm opens up and then they finally come through. Um, and that front shoulder does a lot for them. Release point being eight to 12 inches in front of the stride foot is, is ideal. A lot of times we see it at stride foot or before stride foot, but that greatly increases the amount of stress that we feel on our shoulder and elbows. All right, so max external rotation, scapular upright posture, core rotational exercises, scapular wall slides, chops, single leg squats, uh, sky punches as well, med ball slams, follow through, doing eccentrics, upper back, serratus anterior work especially, um, and stability exercises. Um, and we're, we're gonna go through that. So. Looking at here, I know I had skipped through a bunch of information. We're just kind of running low on time. Um, but looking at a side view, so this is an inefficient pitch delivery, right? So this is from our, our uh, one of our pitching coaches, Tom Landry. He's great. So what we see here is we, he has a really high, oh, really high leg kick. Okay. He's starting to generate that angle, but we can see he's just kind of falling forward. We want him to kind of engage that posterior leg a little bit more. Coming through. 
man. Coming through. So what we see is that front shoulder is very high. One thing I like to point out, well, from especially from an anterior view, uh, is you can't see home plate. Um, so how are you going to throw a strike? Um, so getting, making sure that that's level. Um, and this is what we call that contralateral trunk lean that I had skipped over before. So contralateral trunk lean is just kind of the angle that they have in their shoulders when throwing. We often see it here, as well as when they're accelerating. And we want what we want is we want to minimize that as much as possible. We want them to be as upright and as straight as possible. There's always going to be some sort of contralateral trunk lean because that is how they generate velocity. Um, but we want to minimize that to make that as low as possible. You can see here, so we had talked about that front foot landing. So his front foot has landed very bent, front shoulder has opened. And like I had said, that front arm stability is really, really important. What we would like to see is tucking of that arm, keeping that glove hand over that ankle. So that way that shoulder remains closed, following through together. That front shoulder for him has opened up um, and has caused him to literally lose everything from that core and lower body. He's throwing all arm, coming forward. That release point will be slightly behind his foot. And he follows through. His follow through is actually pretty good, um, minus his balance. So you can see he's kind of following through and he's falling off to the side. I know people point to like Pedro and things like that. He was off balance, but he was controlled. Um, so a lot of times we see with our athletes, they're following through and they have no control in that follow through. Um, and so we want to make sure that they're balanced, they're in control when they're following through. And that way they're dispersing energy from that uh, throw and that posterior musculature uh, properly. All right, so anterior view of this. Okay, so high leg kick coming forwards. So right here, so like I said, you can't see home plate. I like to tell my athletes that, how are you gonna throw a strike? Um, we're coming through. We can see that front shoulder is gone. His, uh, I don't know what he's looking at. He's looking at the moon. Um, he has a little bit of valgus in his, his knee. We want that to be nice and straight. We want it to be slightly bent and we want that glove hand to be kind of tucked into that chest to remain that front shoulder uh, closed. We come through and then, so we talked about that contralateral trunk lean before. Here as well, we have a significant contralateral trunk lean. So Dr. Beasley and I like to look at this, especially because if we take this person who has this angle and we straighten him out and we ask the person, hey, what's your arm slot? A lot of times if they're here, they'll say, okay, I'm a, I'm a three quarters arm slot. When re in reality, if we straighten them out, they are literally throwing sidearm. Um, so we really want to minimize that a lot of core work, um, keeping them upright, core stability, um, shoulder stability, um, to keep them as upright and as in control as possible. As you can see, uh, release is very shallow. Oftentimes, if the release is really shallow, they miss a lot up and away. Um, and he definitely did that. He missed very high up and away. His balance, his balance is off. His glove hand is way outside the lateral portion of his land foot. And he follows through. And in this case, he is actually very balanced. So um, looking at that. Coming here, so this is a very good pitcher, very high level pitcher. Um, so we're up. He's really driving. You can see that, that energy angle that he has created here coming forwards. We look at that stride length. The stride length is great, nice and long. So this is where, where that hip mobility really comes into play. Um, he's nice and strong. He has that back foot drag, that front glove hand is nice and controlled. If we're a little bit more rewind, you can see he's nice and symmetrical on the front and back arm. Um, tucks that glove underneath. He engages that core coming forwards. The release point is eight to 12 inches out in front. You can see he's nice and controlled. And the follow through, you can see how his arm kind of falls into place. So that's what we call a good 
um, controlled follow through as opposed to a reactive follow through. A reactive follow through causes the arm to kind of whip back and that greatly increases the amount of stress we feel in that posterior shoulder. And a, a lot of times that creates that kind of GERD um, that, that pitchers and up overhand throwers see because of that inability to kind of slow down. And finally, looking at the anterior view. Nice and tall, good energy angle, great stride, nice and symmetrical. Front shoulder stays closed, glove stays right over that ankle, which is perfect. He's upright. You can see that contralateral trunk lean is very, very minimal. Follows through nice and across his body and is balanced all the way through. Um, and finally, so what can you do? So take a moment to dig deeper into your athletes, look into their history, get to know them, ask them how their days are going. There could be a lot of other things, like I said, baseball players are very mental. Um, so making sure that you know them well. Um, taking a look at other regions of the body, as Carl and, and Dr. Beasley had said before, looking at the core, the thoracic spine mobility, lumbar spine mobility, lower body mobility, um, and strength as well. Um, and then eventually, yes, their shoulder might be in pain or their elbow might be in pain. And there's an injury to that area, but is that really the cause of that injury? Most times it is due to some sort of mechanical issue or lack of strength or mobility somewhere else. And then just to kind of wrap it all up, so getting an early intervention, identifying those biomechanical kinematic insufficiencies, identifying the injuries, addressed through a good strength program, uh, prevention program, safe progression in your throwers. Listen to your thrower, because um, oftentimes they, they are, they'll know their body better than most. Um, use, like if, if you're a college athletic trainer, you're constantly at those baseball games, listen to your pitcher when they come off the mound, if they wanna stretch, if they wanna ice, listen to them, they know what they need. Um, if they have any pain, take a deeper dive into it and really, really kind of get to know that. Um, and then finally, just be active with your coaches, be involved, um, show them that, hey, we're, I wanna build a program. I wanna uh, sh show you guys like, hey, we can do these exercises, we can do this throwing progression, um, looking at kind of the mechanical issues together. They are the coaches. They're going to coach their athletes uh, in a different way. So making sure that from an injury prevention side that you are also communicating with them as well. All right, and then uh, preventative throwing programs, arm care, strength and conditioning, motor patterning, um, and making sure each of them is individualized. Thank you. Sorry, it was really quick. I could speak about this for hours. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Miguel. Um, can you unshare your screen? Yeah. Okay. Carl, if you can come back on too, I'm just gonna um, uh, throw the three of you up there um, in the event that there's a question that you too. might be able to address. So I see um, uh, there's a question about um, what time frame do we want to uh, do? We prefer to see the patients for their throwing assessment, and it's a great question. Um, we want to, it depends a little bit on, on how, uh, how the patient's struggling. Uh, what I don't tend to recommend is if they're actively in pain or recovering, that's not when we want to see them. We actually like to see them sort of, if we have an identified injury, then you go through a whole treatment program and then begin their return to throwing program. And then we like to see them a bit into their throwing program because we, we want to make sure that if we're, if Miguel and I are assessing their throwing, uh, that we're seeing their real throw, that we're seeing a pain-free sort of their normal mechanics. And so we don't want to see somebody who's throwing through pain. We don't want to see somebody who, you know, has recovered, but hasn't started a return to throwing program. We're sort of seeing their first return. Um, sometimes what we have is consistent pain where uh, uh, the injury is unclear. They've had x-rays or MRIs and that those are normal. And so people don't really know. Then we can assess while they're still actively throwing. If we, if we deem that sort of they're structurally safe, but still struggling with pain, then we'll see them uh, during that. But, but for the most part, we, we want to see their normal throw and normal usually requires pain-free. Great. Um, 
uh, one of the questions is, uh, I noticed no plyos in the program. Yes, I absolutely use upper extremity plyos. I just didn't include it in the email. Uh, eccentric ball drops um, are one of my favorite things. Prone ball drops, whether at 90 degrees, fully extended, absolutely, you can incorporate those. I know, so there's a whole hot topic on, um, I forget what the name of that program is that Trevor Bauer uses. Um, I forget, I don't know, Dr. Beasley, you remember the name of that? I, I don't, but I know what you're talking about. Um, so they, that's a whole other st uh, subject, but they do do some good kind of eccentric loading, catching from your backside, eccentrically stopping, throwing back, fantastic as well. Um, those are kind of my three go-tos in terms of the plyometrics program um, that I, I like to do kind of the second month or the month before kind of um, getting into that baseball. Um, in your throwing programs, you use the MODIS pulse device. I don't use MODIS. Um, I have in the past. Um, I found that it's, it's a little iffy. It can be very inconsistent because that MODIS on the sleeve tends to slide up and down every once in a while. So um, that's where we need kind of the athletes to be honest with themselves and us um, to really kind of focus at, okay, go 50% of what you're at, 75% of what you're at. Um, you can absolutely use MODIS. Um, if you if you have an athlete that you don't exactly trust um, to monitor that, but uh, we we have it here, but we don't we don't use it. And I would I would also say most people might not have modus, <laughs> so so uh, just kind of yeah, like I said, honesty is is going to be your best friend for sure. Thanks, guys. Um, anyone else have some last minute questions? It can be for anyone. Or all three of them. No, any uh, last take home messages? For me, I just say volume. Volume is the key. Uh, we talk a lot about rehab, a lot about analysis, and the key is just making sure that your volume is uh, is controlled. I think that's the you know, time and time again, every bit of literature, everything that shows that if, uh, if the volume is down, we tend to do well. Uh, and so any way that you can control that volume, being realistic about pitch counts, uh, that counts bullpen, you got to think about bullpens, you got, um, uh, and so watch volume. I think for my uh, other athletic trainers, so being active um, in, in kind of their programs and throughout the season, especially if you're college, um, high school might be a little bit more difficult um, but being active with the coaches, with the athletes, making sure you take the time. I know baseball is not like the most impactful sport where we're dealing with a lot of injuries, but a lot of overuse stuff for sure. A lot of maintenance. It takes a lot of time um, out of kind of your day in terms of maintenance, um, making sure that they are getting kind of they're maintaining their range of motion, their strength, making sure they're staying on top of their programs as well. I actually have one more question come in. <clears throat> I can, um, so um, with blood flow restriction, um, we have found good results with it outside of children's. It hasn't been cleared to be used at the McKaylee Center. Um, on the other hand, I find that if a person is just following a progressive program and the people that actually certify you in blood flow will say, if the person can actually do the workout by themselves with the progressive um, program, you don't necessarily need blood flow. Um, it's more usually for the cases of those people that can't use um, their progressive maximal weights. Um, but there's been some comments at Children's that they just didn't want to implement it yet just because of uh, rhabdo or anything like that, if there was ever a chance of something like that. So we don't use it at, at Children's. Thanks, Carl. All right. Um, if you have any remaining questions, you can always email um, the email address that I sent you the link from hello at the McKaylee And if you specify who it's for, I can pass that on to, for you too and get a response back. Um, again, this is being recorded, so it will be up this week. Um, you'll get an email with your certificate and you'll get an email with evaluation that we hope you take the time to fill out. I want to thank um, Dr. Beasley, Carl, and Miguel for joining us this morning. Um, and really giving some great information and being collaborative on your um, presentations. That was really helpful um, so that we didn't always have like the repetition, but you kind of fed off of each other, which is great, especially in this kind of setting that it's hard to like 
feed off of people, each other when it's virtual. Um, so I really appreciate it. Um, again, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I, you will get, we'll have one over the summer, probably in June or July. We'll get that information out to you as soon as we have it. You can always check our website again. And thank you guys for being our presenters this morning. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.